Hi, this is Braden Holpe. Hey, this is Tanner the Bulldozer Bozer. Hi, this is Brian Burke from Toronto, Ontario. This is Daryl Sutter. Hello, everyone. I'm Carly Agro from Sportsnet Central. This is Jay Onright. This is Quick Dick Quick Dick coming to you from Tufnell, Saskatchewan. Hey, everybody. My name is Steel Fleury. This is Kelly Rudy. This is Corey Cross. This is Wade Redden. This is Jordan Tutu. My name is Jim Patterson. Hey, it's Ron McLean, Hockey Net in Canada and Rogers Hometown Hockey, and welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the podcast, folks. Uh, I got a good friend of mine in today, but before we get to Kenny, let's get on to today's episode sponsors. HSI Group, they're the local oil field burners and combustion experts that can help make sure you have a compliance system working for you. The team also offers security, surveillance, and automation products for residential, commercial, livestock, and agricultural applications. I mean, when you can check on the well-being of your facility, your livestock by simply pulling out your phone and checking on the cameras in today's weather. Wouldn't you enjoy that? I think you would. Stop in at 3902 52nd Street or give a Brody or Kim a call at 306-825-6310. They use technology to give you peace of mind so you can focus on the things that truly matter. Clay Smiley and the team over at Profit River. Uh, is the Profit River is a retailer of firearms, optics, and accessories serving all of Canada. They specialize in importing firearms from the United States, hard-to-find calibers, rare firearms, special editions. Check them out at ProfitRiver.com. Teaming up with the Lloyd Minster Regional Health Foundation. I actually just had a meeting with uh, with Michelle, uh, a lady from the Red Bicycle, that's helping with the uh, marketing side of things. And we got we got a cool day coming up here, December fifteenth. It's a seven a.m. to seven p.m. Facebook live stream. That's twelve hours of different guests coming on. We're raising money for a really good cause here for the hospital and continuing care in Lloyd Minster. Last year uh, we did the same event. We raised $50,000 for a new Pixis automated pill dispensing machine. And this year, there's a whole list of things we're trying to get money for. Obviously, COVID, not only um, attacking, you know, people, uh, but businesses have been struggling. And the hospital is having, uh, you know, ramp up for things that they could have never predicted. And not to mention that continuing care. We all have a loved one that's that's sitting in, in a, one of those homes and the difficulties they're going through. So we're trying to raise money for all that. Be on the lookout December 15th, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, look forward to having you guys hop on uh, with that. Clint and the team over at Trophy Gallery, they offer tri- championship belts, custom medals, die-cast signage, name tags, uh, engraving on Yetis and Brumates. Let me tell you, I got a couple of SMP uh, Brumates, and I... <laughs> I had a little bit of tea. Uh, as everybody knows, I'm not having any social beverages right now. I'm on day 22. So I had some tea, threw it in one of these brewmates, and normally, you know, after, what, 10 minutes, the hot water's cooled off so you can actually slip it, uh, slip it, sip it. And, uh, man, burnt the entire mouth because here I went to go take a swig. The cups are fantastic. His work on it's unreal. And uh, I should also mention they do business awards in crystal and glass. He ships Canada wide. If you go to trophygallery.ca, they got over 5,000 products. Use promo code Newman for 15% off. Any sport, any time, uh, from Bonnie building to hockey, visit Trophy Gallery. And uh, Clint and the team will get you hooked up. Gartner Management is the Lloyd Minster. Uh, base company specializing in all types of rental properties to help meet your needs. Whether you're looking for a small office or a 6,000 square foot commercial space, give Mr. Wade Gartner a call at 780-808-5025. SMP billboard across from the UFA. Drove by it on the way out to Helm on the other night for uh, the senior game between them and Lashburn. The, the Flyers and the Hitmen going at it. Nice to see senior hockey back. And let me tell you, just one of those moments. I, I stared up and I'm driving by and I'm like, man, that's a sharp looking sign. And I got to give a shout out to Read and Write and of course Miss Deanna Wandler. Together they have just they make they make it look easy. So if you're looking uh, looking to get a billboard tossed up, visit Read and Write. Talk to Deanna Wandler. They'll get you hooked up. Now if you're heading into any of these businesses, make sure please make sure you let them know you heard on them heard about them on the podcast. They like to know that uh, you're listening. And it helps both of us. Now, if you're interested in advertising on the show, visit SeanNewmanPodcast.com, top right corner, hit the contact button, send me your info. We got lots of different options, and I want to find something that can work for the both of us. Now, let's get on to that T-Bar 1, Tale of the Tape. (music) 
Originally from Paradise Hill, Saskatchewan, he's married and has six kids. Yes, six. Is a professor at Lakeland College, owns his own appraisal business, is a co-host of a new podcast, War on Weakness. Yeah, I'm talking about my good friend, Ken Rutherford. So buckle up. Here we go. This is Ken Rutherford, and I'd like to welcome you to the Sean Newman Podcast. Welcome to the Sean Newman Podcast. He's back. <laughs> it was, you know, first you were my first guest, Kenny. Uh, Ken Rutherford's in the studio. For, uh, thanks for joining me. You betcha, Sean. I always, you know, I get too excited. But, you know, it was it was February. Um, it was released February 14th is what it says on the on the app. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think we were doing it on Valentine's Day. But it was, re- we recorded in February 2019, which is damn near two years ago. You were my first guest. We butchered it. Uh, it was good. Actually, when I was listening to it, I'm like, Kenny always said we butchered it. And I remember you're like, you're not going to show this to anyone, right? And I'm like, no, no, no. And then I got out the door and I'm like, I'm totally going to show a few people. I'm too excited. And then now it's become the pilot episode for what this this has become, right? And uh, I pleaded with you to come back on and you have pushed me away for some time now. But now I've finally coaxed you back in. So, that, I mean, it's been an almost two years since you were in here last time. And I think it's high time. I mean, you helped build the first studio in the basement of an old house that was your office at the time. My how times have changed. And uh, now you get to come in and see what I've put together. And I'm, I don't know, man, I'm, ha- I'm happy to have you back in. Well, you and I are, are good friends, Sean. And <clears throat> to call it your first episode, we, we, just so your listeners understand i'm in no way famous no way important no way influential i'm just a normal dude and i was not upset but uh we were supposed to be (laughs) testing your equipment (laughs) on your way to go become a what you are today and then you said i'm releasing it and i was like oh sean come on (laughs) that wasn't in the deal and it got released that's fine you know the uh it was a fun did you hear any negative feedback from that episode i i think to have negative feedback you'd have to have people listen to it and i (laughs) i uh, (laughs) so the good news is no but uh uh, and then again sean you you asked me many times to to come back on and uh, i like I really care about you and I care about your your passion. I care about your goals here. And I thought it wasn't the right time to have a nobody on for a time where you're trying to build listeners. Listeners like or for for good or bad, they they you get Wayne Gretzky on here, you're gonna get a whole pile of people listening. And to make one of these businesses build, you need listeners. And uh, I, I didn't want to be somebody that was gonna slow you down. Now here you are, you've 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 uh oh to say made it. I don't know if that's the right word, but you've got your traction. And you've got your listeners. And so as a friend, you've asked me, and I, th- my, I told my wife when you stopped and asked the last time, you know, when I, I think in some cultures, if you, if you invite somebody in for supper and you say no, it's offensive. And you asked me, I don't know, six, seven, eight times. And I've told you no, and I feel like I'm, I'm going to be starting to say no, I'm, I'm good when you invite me over for supper. So I'm, Sean wants to. And, and now it's <clears throat> just you and I, we're, we're good friends. We seem to have a, a synergy or a um, I don't, I, I think in, from my perspective, something special happens when you and I mix and I'm, I'm sure you have that with other people cause you're, you're a special dude, but I, I treasure the moments to do this with you. And I, I, I'm thankful to be a part of your story. Well, first off, I haven't made Jack squat and, uh, I do appreciate the journey it's been. I, I don't mean that in a negative way. I just, I, you know, we, we talk a lot about, off air like where you want to be in five years that type of thing and i guess when i say i haven't made jack squat i just i'm further down the road but i'm not where i want to be i guess Uh, the second thing is i I laugh when people say you know if you had wayne gretzky on and wayne gretzky is probably honest to god is probably in a class with michael jordan and and a couple guys like that where you're absolutely right if i got wayne gretzky on or michael jordan uh, sure. you're absolutely right. I, could, would you take them over a, a Ken Rutherford and bump Ken for a week? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I <laughs> no, think, I, I, I think any name I've had, and this is no knock on any, uh, famous guy. And I put that in quotes or high profile guy. It's funny. I, I look at the numbers that come in and the best episodes minus quick Dick McDick. And I've told quick this 
uh, multiple times, and it's why he's uh, come back on, is he's so popular right now across all of my listenership. His episode comes on, it shoots to the right to the top. Uh, Paul Bissonnette was one that was like wow factor. Mm-hmm. But other than that, it's all been local people who've had the best opening weeks by far. What happens over time is if you have Ron McLean on, people see that and are looking back through what you've done, obviously they're going to click on that. And so yep. re- name recognition goes a long way uh, over time. But like, honestly, if I had the choice of having you or some guy who played third line in the show, don't get me wrong. I want the third line guy. I think it's going to be interesting, but I enjoy these. And I was telling you before these, uh, these episodes where I get to talk about personal things about a little more give and take between the, the, the person talking and the person listening or vice versa. They're what spur you on to do another 50 episodes. In my opinion. It's interesting. Maybe it, it, uh, as opposed to me and my story, if I'm uh, somebody who played third line in the show, where you're extracting my story, this is a dialogue between the two of us. And it's something special when you listen to it a year, five year, 10 years down the road, because it's really not, maybe I'm kind of interviewing you and you're interviewing me because it's just a conversation up between, with me being nobody famous. It's just two friends talking. And maybe it becomes, you know, when you were listening to our first podcast, uh, it's it's kind of special, like we were talking about. We've had a lot of life changes since then. Well, it, well it's like a picture. We Is we it? were bugging each other that Kenny doesn't like. Okay, right off the hop, the first thing I say pretty much in the first podcast we did was Kenny. As I'm introing you, fa- uh, you know, businessman, blah blah blah, help build the studio, and he doesn't like birth control because he's got five kids. Well, if anyone knows Kenny right now, how many kids he got? Uh, we had our sixth. Yeah, it was a surprise that uh, the. The we weren't planning it, and it was a surprise, and it was a holy sh something t right. And uh, it, I'll tell you what, that's 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 one of the highlights of my life so far. I mean, having every kid, but when you weren't supposed to have another one, and you do, and, and I gotta give a lot of credit to my wife. My wife is. I just told you the other night actually that uh, uh, what I set out to marry, uh, I exceeded that. You know, I had a I had a picture in my mind when I was 14, 15, 16 years old of who I wanted to marry. And uh, uh, and I wanted something that was good with kids. And and my wife is just so patient and so kind. And oh, she had a few tears and a few swear words for me when she was when we found she was pregnant. But yeah, like that little fella, little Benjamin is what we, we named our, our son. He uh, he's a highlight of our household. It's, we, we race for him. When you hear him start to squawk, it's a race from everybody in the household who gets to pick him up next. So it makes me wonder, like the, our society seems to be pushing people to have two kids, you know, or I think the national average might be 1.6 per, per couple or something like that. I can't remember the number now, but, but I think that's maybe a mistake is one of our primary purposes is to procreate, I, th- I think. And, and there's a, well, you'd know this, there's a hard, huge sense of accomplishment or bonding with your wife or to watch a life that, 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 you know, depends on you and you know it's been really special so yeah we've, we've had our sixth kid and a lot of people laugh at us you know it's it's a they're, they're laughing at, at me not with me a lot and I'm okay with that I've, I've come to the conclusion a long time ago that society's uh, wills or what's popular changes from time to time and there would have been a time people would have made fun of you for having two kids because it's not enough and now they make fun of you for having more than two because it's too many hey it's everybody's got their own walk and it works for us and and I'm very thankful for it a, I think it's, I always admire the way you talk about your kids and your wife and your family. It's it's something I hold very high on my, um, I don't know, list of things that are important to me in life. So I really like the way you talk about having kids and uh, the way you look at your wife and how important she is to your life because that just resonates with me. This weekend, we had five kids uh, the oldest turns five in January. So, but still four and under essentially. Right. And all I could think of was my parents. They had five kids or you with six. And you know, the crazy thing was with five kids, I was really sh- in my brain before they came over. I'm like, ah, this is going to be stressful. Like I'm, I'm like building up the stress of having five kids and 
what ended up coming out of it was like, man, it was a lot of fun. And my wife laughed at me. Mel laughed at me. She looked at me. She's like, you want to have another kid? I'm like, I tell you what, with our last one, Mel got her tubes cut out. It was mm-hmm. a long story, but yep. essentially we're not having any more kids. And I said, honestly, if, uh, if, uh, if this is what women get, baby fever, right? Like, yeah. I'm like, I'd probably have a fourth. Because, I mean, like, it's, that's pretty... Uh, having all those kids around the table and the interactions and everything, which is going to happen with our three for sure as they mature and get a little older and actually can have conversations. But the five of them interacting, Kenny, was like, you didn't need to go anywhere for entertainment. Let's leave it at that. Like, it was... It was... Uh, the house was just like full of life. Mm-hmm. And it was cool to be around for uh, for a night. And three and the two parents, believe me, is full of life. And at one point in time, one kid was all you needed to be full of life. And But as time went on, uh, you almost, me and Mel laugh about it. You almost mastered having one kid. And then you almost master having two. And then you get the third and you're like, never again. And here I am sitting and you almost feel like you have it mastered. Not in the sense you can predict the future and everything else, but... Yeah you kind of get comfortable with it where busy is the new norm and you're okay with that. Yep. You get used to chaos. I'm, I mean, you're from a big family. I'm the oldest of six. And so to me, uh, chaos is just where it's at. It's not a normal house unless you hear motorbikes ripping, two kids fighting, you know, <laughs> somebody, you know, hogging the bathroom, you know, mom's yelling at somebody. And it's just our house. And it's uh, it's a lot of fun. And it makes me think like when you say that those are the special days, like I, I think I, I try to, talk to people older than me and listen to them and granted this isn't exactly a scientific study because it's only in my social circle but I find that a lot of people when they talk for the most part their 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 most treasured years are when they were child raising or raising children and one day they leave the home and it seems like people say you have no idea how much you're going to miss the rink you have no idea you're going to miss you know, summer holidays and, and going to the lake and fishing with, with your, your son or your daughter or, or you know, uh, watching your daughter, you know, get dressed up for her graduation or that type of thing, right? And so to me, I have, I, it's interesting that so many people want to rush through those years or shorten them so that they can get back to living, right? It's, it, it's in like, it's going to be fun to have the kids gone from the house and go to Mexico every second Saturday for drinking pina coladas on the, on the beach. And I, I just don't think that's for me. I, I think having kids at boy, it sure gives you a lot of responsibility, but it sure gets you involved in your community and gets you, you know, I, I've coached a couple of hockey games on the weekend, coached oh, all my kids, you know, man, we do a lot with them and I ski a lot. I do martial arts with them. I, you know, like you're just getting rolling. You're in from some, in for some good years and boy, does it ever keep you busy, but, uh, it's, well, we're going to blink twice. And we're going to be 90 years old and this thing's going to be winding down. So, might as well, if, they, if we are going to look back and say these are most treasured years, why don't we treat them like they are and, and, and stop belly aching about them and, and enjoy them? Well, I'll shout out to Norm Jans because that's what Normie always tells me, yep. right? Like you, you're going to enjoy when your kids are young enough that they still worship the ground you walk yeah. on and aren't old mm-hmm. enough to tell you to go F off and everything else, right? Yeah. You know, you bring up responsibility. I was listening to, you know, another thing – in the first podcast we talked, we, we, we touch on is mm-hmm. that we're in a book club together. Well, that's been going now for, that's how the podcast idea got started. Mm-hmm. You know, I presented it to the group. Uh, I was telling, um, I think it was Mikey dubs. I was telling him that I sent you guys basically, uh, a voice recording from Calgary with an idea and I presented it to the book club. And in that book club is where this all gets started. And where these conversations really started to roll. But one of the guys we went and saw was Jordan Peterson. And Jordan Peterson's thoughts on responsibility, to steal the word that you used about having kids, he says that's where the meaning of life is, right, is having responsibility. Well, is there any more responsibility than to look out for kids underneath you? Mm -hmm. And again, leaning on to Jordan Peterson, I know it because for other psychologists, but I've just heard him talk about it is how important it is to... um, stay married and be in a healthy relationship and, and be a good father and a good mother, you know, the, the impact it has on that next generation. And so it's, it's been some of that is, that has really fueled me to try to not try do, uh, make my marriage with my wife, uh, all that it can be. 
And when you talk about me inspiring you, I, I got a first thing that comes to my mind is, is Frank Mann and Candyman. Yeah. You know, I, I remember you and I being in the Hitman dressing room and I remember thinking like, there's Frank, right? And he, he would come in and, and have a beer with everybody, uh, two-step with his wife. She'd laugh and giggle. I remember thinking, look at that. It was, he was in his 70s, I think, at, at the time. And, and I'm like, you know what? That's, that's going to be, I want to be him. I want to be, I want to be 75, uh, two-stepping with my wife, looking at her like she's the most beautiful woman in the room. And uh, so we all have our, our influences, don't we? And and so uh, uh, I, I I'm honored that you look at me like that. I look I look at you that way. The in a society where divorce rates are, are I believe the numbers are over fifty percent now. And it's as you know, I guess I'm I'm older in years than you. And as much as I say we get along, it's not easy. You know, there's been uh, good days and bad days. But when you, for me, the what what's got us through for me personally is this when you. So I'd say my, my goal is when I'm old to be still married to my wife, you know, uh, uh, you know, that's, that's kind of one of, one of my, my drivers. And thankfully my wife has stuck, stuck it out with me. I, I think she's got the worst deal out of the two of us. Well, here's the thing. You say there's been good days and there's been bad days. Yeah. I think Hollywood, maybe, maybe Disney, I don't know who it is, sells you the idea that that isn't what marriage life is. I mean, mm. th- there's going to be good days and bad days. And over the course of, you know, you know, hopefully, hopefully I live into my 70s, so that's maybe even 80s. That's 40, 50 years of marriage kind of thing. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you better believe there's going to be some rocky road ahead of you. But it's the ability to navigate that water that makes a, a relationship last, right? Because, listen, I got friends, you got friends. The first sign of trouble, mm-hmm. they're out. And that... I'm not talking about marriage. I'm talking about dating people. Mm-hmm. I mean, it doesn't have to be any further than that, right? Yeah. I've had those... Co- when Mel and I were first dating, what a lot of people... Maybe people know. I, I don't know. Is Mel's from Minnesota. I'm from, obviously, Lloydminster, Hillmont. So every summer for like three months, we were apart. And distance, if anyone's done distance, sucks. And I had friends at different times say, you know, why do you even hang in there? Why don't you just... And I never understood that thought process. I guess I always went, why date someone if, you know, Mm -hmm. the first sign of anything, you're out the door. I mean, if it's bad, obviously. There's, there's, there are uh, signs and signals and red, you know, like maybe this isn't working out. I should leave. But at the same time, if just because you got to go away for a little bit, now you're running out the door. That makes no sense to me. Yeah. And it's, uh, when you think about divorce, I think, uh, w- well, we just finished Maps of Meeting with Jordan Peterson. And there's a snippet uh, for people that don't know him. The, obviously, he's had influence. His name's come up four times now, I think. But the, he has a snippet. If you're thinking about getting a divorce or you're thinking about going down there, that even entertaining that thought, right? There's a, him in his lecture series at the University of Toronto. And he puts it all on the line, doesn't he? He's like, like, honestly, like if anybody's listening to this, uh, anybody, <laughs> I don't know how many with Ken, with Ken Rutherford on here, but you should listen to that because it's Google Jordan Peterson, uh, divorce talk. It's, it's like, you better get ready for, to get, be poor, to be stressed. Uh, you're not what he's called indentured servant, right? Yeah. When you've got kids, you know, those are still your kids. You still got to pay for them. So you got to worry about them. And now somebody else is going to be. Right, if my wife and I got started, she's going to have another boyfriend, or, or that husband or boyfriend is not going to love those kids like I do. I'm going to go like you know, it's just, she's messy, <laughs> right? So it's it's not all, you know, daffodils and and uh, and unicorns and fairy dust, is it? It's so I it, I, it, I think you should have that real conversation, it's, you, you know, with yourself and, and yeah, I think we just leave it at that because I mean that's not where I'm I'm headed, but but it's. Right now, I, I have one wife, one one group of children, and I get it. Sometimes they break down. There's going to be people that are, you know. Oh, yeah. There's always, there always is the case. And I'm not it. judging from a high horse because we all know that everybody's two or three bad shakes from life being upside down, right? You know, a, you know, a, a disease or a, an addiction or a, you know, a suicide attempt or a, we don't, you know, I, I like Ken's life has been pretty easy. So it's easy for me to say I held my, my marriage together. One of the things that the book club, you know, um, it's funny. When we first started the book club in the first episode, we were almost hesitant to say we were in a book club. It was kind of funny, yeah. actually. I, I laugh about it when yeah. I listen to it now because I'm actually very proud of it. And one of the things we did, I'm in the middle of it right now. I'm on day, 
uh it's the 22nd 22nd day of not drinking yep and uh which two years ago we sat in a book club meeting and i said maybe we should just do like a month and everyone's like a month are you crazy mm-hmm. and we can't do it, you know and now 22 days doesn't even seem like that big of a deal like it, it, it's it's almost become normal place i've done it uh three or four times now mm-hmm. and it's it's not even don't get me wrong. There's nights, sure, you're sitting out at the Hitman game last night mm-hmm. and you want to sit and have a sarsaparilla. Sure. But one of the things the book club did was I felt, you know, when you talk about divorce and things like that and drugs and addictions and everything, I felt like two years ago I leaned on drinking a little too much. By doing things like this, it took it took that power away from it. It's really been a growth, hasn't it, Sean? Like it, it, it's, it's been a, a testament to to helping each other grow when there's more than just your mind and your influences and have other people around you to kind of bounce ideas and watch, you know, suggest books and debate it. And and I would say our book club, maybe it's, it's the topic that we choose. Like I'm sure we could have like something that's dark and, and, and uh, sometimes evil, but we don't have that. We're trying to, trying to understand and improve and, and think and be, be kinder and better and, 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 you know, more understanding, I think. And, and so, yeah, it's been amazing, actually, hasn't it? To on, on a personal influence, and my life certainly is not perfect in all regards. But I would say, all else being equal, it's had a very positive influence on my life. And so, I thank you for that, and, and our book club. And I encourage everybody else to do it too. There's, may, may, to me, I'm trying to find the new macho, and the new macho is is somebody who stays married to their wife, uh, isn't into porn, <laughs> not you know, not 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 uh, ditching the kids at every chance you can get. You know, uh, you know why? Why is not macho? You know, and so in the book club has kind of helped, helped uh, foster that. I think in all of us, I, I, I see a change in all of us. So, you know, I'll, I'll let other people keep their own story. That's just my own observation of of our club. So do it. Go like join a club, even if it's three people. Just grab a book. And the nice thing is, when you have accountability, you, you get through it, right? Even if. You know, when you say, look, I'm going to listen to this podcast by the first of the next month, you know, nobody has time to do it, but you find a way to do it. And then you come in it. The, well, that, the, the I, find, I find that line right there really funny, right? I don't have the time. And yeah. I always go back. You make the time for things that are meaningful to you, right? Like everybody wonders how you have time to do this. How I, I ask you all the time, like, how do you have time to do all the things you're into? Hmm. And yet... It's it's almost like a state a mind uh, a mindset of like I'm not gonna stop moving for the entire day today I'm gonna and that's cool and then, uh, this coming Sunday which is five days off I got like a three four hour period at night and I'm gonna I'm gonna sit down and have a a social beverage maybe watch a show with the wife whatever and and kind of have like me time or whatever right where you're sitting on the couch enjoying like some sit down but then it's like yep but then I'm gonna get back at it hmm so you're comedy about me. Yeah. Well, um, uh, well, no, just in general. Just oh, yeah. in general, you, you use the line, I don't have the oh, time. I see, see. And I find yeah. lots of people say that, Kenny. And I just think they're lying to themselves. But that's okay. Because if if what you want and what means a lot to you is Sundays or for watching football from noon till eight, that's cool. And then on Mondays, you watch the Monday Nighter. That's cool. And Thursday nights, you watch the Monday Nighter. I'm sticking to football. Apologize, football fans. But then in the meantime, you want to start... Okay, started a podcast. The idea was I was going to release an episode like once a month. That was the original idea. It has come a long way since there. It's taken me, we wrote at the Hitman game uh, last, night. last night. That was a little painful for me because yeah. I still feel like I can play. Yeah. And, you know, there's probably a few guys listening and laughing going, no, you can't. That's fine. I have wanted to play until I was 40. Hell, maybe 45. I wanted to see my kids see me grow and, and and come out to games and watch and I'm you know how much the hitman mean to me and how much work I've put into that program. And to go out there and just watch and everybody go, Why aren't you playing? Why aren't you playing? Well, it's because of time. I had to choose. I really, really enjoy this and I've had to give up other things and I didn't know that was gonna happen two years ago. And maybe if I'd known that, maybe I would have approached things differently. Mm-hmm. But one of the things recently I've had to give up is the hitman. That sucks because well, we were out there last night. How much fun was that being out there watching the game? You know, COVID going on and social mm-hmm. distancing and everything. Just to be back in the rink and have some senior hockey. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, It was. Uh, I think it would be harder on you this year. I mean, I'll, you put more into it than I did. I coached for a few years. <clears throat> and 
you know, was heavily involved with the rink and with coaching and, and, and that team and, uh, community fundraisers. And, you know, both of us put a lot of blood, sweat and tears into it. And, you know, can't forget about Norm Jans and Brad Simons and Marine and Rod and, you know, like the whole league, right? There's a lot of, a lot of volunteers that go into it. And, uh, for me, I would say it's one of the things I'm struggling with right now. I would say, you know, part of my life is is really going well right now. And part of it is struggling, just like everything. You know, it's like when you're talking about, I think we'll talk about maybe a little bit later, but, you know, the, uh, uh, is the, the time poverty thing. And, and I would, it was a little bit hard on me and I'm sure it's a little bit hard on you. Because when you and I were, were working with the, with the Hitman and for the last couple of years, it was a franchise that was really, really booming on all ends and and everything has some ups and downs and I was really proud of those boys but I think they went into Lashburn with nine nine skaters on Friday and pulled out an OT loss you know grabbed a point out of it and again an OT loss last night and you know Graham Murray you know like uh, stepped up and and you know has a C from from your your former sweater and he's coaching and he's running practices and he's talking to players and and trying to get sponsorship and Norm's trying to step away and they don't have a head coach and there's some good people in that room. You know, the, the, to me, that's, there's some really good people. It's a little bit hard on me to watch it and not step in and do something, you know, to help put some wind into its sails. Not that I could do much, but I could do something. And, I'm, and I can't even imagine what it feels like for you uh, to know that you can still play and that you can have an influence in something that is part of, well, your family's history and, and your history. And so to me, it's a little bit hard, isn't it? Like to me, the... Uh, to watch it stumble, you want, not not stumble. That's the, and that doesn't take anything. Those guys are good hockey players, man. They 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 I just mean, pull out a win last night against what? What do they have? Uh, how many players on the on the? Well, last I, last one fo- showed up with a full squad, yeah. and and I don't think uh, the word stumble is 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 wrong yeah. term. It's when you don't have a head coach. Now this is on now this is on COVID. This is not on any yep. of the the players going on. This isn't on anyone. But when when you show up and you have nine guys the first game, I mean we haven't had that since. Your first year of coaching, my first year head coach. Yeah, we had. <laughs> yeah, we, you know, Lashburn. Br- it was let's, Lashburn. Let, let's give the, let's the Newman give, line. <laughs> let's give Graham yeah. some kudos here. Oh yeah, he didn't call up Jason Newman. Yeah, Dustin, Harley, Nate, and then dress a full Newman line for the yeah. opening faceoff. Right. Yeah, we pulled out every trick in the book that first game mm-hmm. in order to have a roster to go in Lashburn with. Yeah, we, the boys gutted it out on the on Friday night. Nine guys, like yeah, fun watching them. Like it's, it's, uh, it was fun to watch. It's been a while since Hillman's been the underdog, right? It was kind of fun to watch the underdog and boy, it was, it was, it was fun watching them. There, there's still some good skaters. They got, they got some good hockey. They could use, well, let's just say probably five more skaters would have, would have come in pretty handy. Well, and as we know, and Graham's probably saying, as you listen to this, yeah, we got five more. They, they got guys coming and that, that's great. What you're getting at is a year ago, maybe, maybe two years ago, um, Head coach was there. We were making cuts. There's 29, yeah. 30 guys. Uh, we were doing a fundraiser. Mm-hmm. We had the Dusty Man tro- uh, Memorial, which right now, hopefully March, mm-hmm. right? But that was booming. Then you had the benefit game. Uh, the Bandits, Junior B Bandits. Junior yeah. B Bandits came out and raised like, you know, what did that event raise over a three-year span? 60 grand? I think we had 60 grand raised over three years to give to families that were struggling, yeah. Right. The Christmas dinners that went out to families, yeah, and then uh, provincial run. We went. Played. We went. Well, that year we struggled. We actually won bronze at Pro- provincials and made a, a final series. Right, like it's, year, yeah. it's it's no. I don't know if it's difficult for me to watch. It's it's frustrating that I I can't. I can make time. It feels like mm-hmm. for the last ten years to do whatever my mind yeah. is set as right. I'm sitting out there and I go, yep. I just want to strap the skates on and go play. Yep. But I know where that leads. Yeah. I right. Know. And I know how my body works. Merv Mann once told me way back when, when I first got the, came back and Brad had the hitman going and I hopped on. I said, well, let's go get the man boys, right? Like Morgan and Merv mm-hmm. won Allen Cups. They're from the area. Like, let's get them on. Ah, you can't. And Merv told me back then, I would love to, but if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it 110%. I don't just show up to games. I don't just blah, blah, blah. And I was like, no, come on. Like, you can do it. And now I'm sitting, I'm probably a few years younger than when Merv retired, but I'm sitting relative with Merv is, and I go, I get it, right? Because I'm, if I play, well, then I want to be at all the practices because I, I don't want to show up to a game here and a game there. What, what's What good is that? We've seen that, what that does to a team, mm-hmm. right? Having guys come in for a couple games and yep. then disappear for yep. a month, right? 
not earn their spot on not the top earn their line spot and, yeah. and right like we've gone through all those woes which is never fun and may, maybe sean the uh maybe in times of trial it lets other people have their time to rise to the call as you see in graham murray do right and and uh, way hill and some of those fine boys in that room maybe it's it's their turn to rebuild it and recruit and get on with some benefit games and and do it better different in their own style and i think i think they got the right people in the room to do that you know so it's maybe just time to transfer onto some other shoulders and let some other people have their well, i remember murray mcdonnell telling me he was in rugby built a rugby program yep. in lashburn right and stepping away from that being really really difficult because you're you're giving up control yep. right but he said it was the healthiest thing to do. There was young guys yeah. there ready to grab sure. it and run with it. And so yep. that's probably the biggest thing that's that's tough in, in passing it on is like the you you no longer have control of everything. I've had, you know, there's been a group of us there. You know, when I walked in, uh, Marlene, Rod, Brad Simons, Norm Jans, I think, are the four. Those four had been there for a while, still there, Yep. right? Marlene's in Edmonton. Maureen stepped in and has done an amazing mm-hmm. job. But they were there, and for like 10 years since I've been back, played for the same team, and have, you almost miss going to that group. Because, you know, I talk about a lot in mm-hmm. volunteering with um, uh, the archive interviews, is why do you enjoy volunteering so much? Well, when you get a healthy group, and you know you're showing up to, mm-hmm. to work with Ken and Brad or whoever mm-hmm. your Ken and Brad are, or your norm for that matter, whoever they are, if you enjoy going to that, it's like a social outing. And that's what a lot of people don't understand, I don't think, about volunteering is if you can build that group that you go volunteer with, that's a lot of fun to show up. And instead of it being work, now it becomes like a little bit of a social outing. Now you've got your, you're doing something really good for the community. As a person or as a couple, you can have a social outing that still has you in bed at a decent time and you're not being, you know, mm-hmm. up to the bar or whatever. And it's healthy. And yeah. you get to see your friends in the meantime, right? Yeah. Everybody, it's like a win, 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 win. Yeah. No, I've, And I miss that. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and so do I. The, uh, but maybe like, let, let's, let's see what the future holds. Like I, I, I do find that I sure enjoyed working with you. Like I found maybe we're equally crazy. <laughs> uh, uh, but I found like when I was do, coaching the Hitman and you're, you're a captain is, boy, I, I, it, there was not any lack of care or try or effort. And I put probably, probably to put too much into it. Maybe, no, I probably put the right amount and probably you did too. If you're going to do something, you know, especially if it's from your heart and it's free and it's a volunteer position. It was, uh, it was good. I should, maybe we'll get another chance, Sean, to do something, you know, I, I'm sure we will. As but, time, as time, the the road you just never wear, know where it leads, and yeah. I should maybe let you get uh, Ben at a diapers. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So the uh, yeah, so hope hope Hitman. I know the Hitman will keep going. It'd be nice to see them some go, and I like to see the the league get a little bit more health. Maybe you know the Saskatchewan was maybe having a an issue or two. You know, I, I don't want to get into the inner politics of it by any means, but it, it's uh, well, it, it makes you appreciate. Uh, I was saying to you this before, like if, if Ken Rutherford was paid a hundred thousand dollars to ensure the Hillman Hitman continue for the next, that's his job, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody understands that the Hitman should never disappear or oh, just look at all the teams that have come in and taken leaves of absence right now. It's Maidstone's got a leave of absence. Neilberg. Um, Neilberg, uh, two Hills. Is Two Hills? Actually, I don't know if Two Hills is playing in the Alberta side. It's a weird year this year. With mm. no Two Hills is playing. Oh, they're good. Is playing. Okay, Marwain. Yeah. Um, PV had been for the longest time, right? Yeah. They, but you understand when it isn't paid positions and it's a volunteer-ran community team, how impressive it is when a team like, well, I was saying to you, Dewberry, you know. Uh, to all the the Dewberry Mustangs, I don't love giving you too much love. We we went to war quite an yep. awful lot in the games. But what's impressive about them is they've had a long tenure of like never having breaks or leaves or whatever, or uh, going to Wilkie and seeing how long they've been going, or Rosetown, right, and how long their history is. Mm-hmm. Like things like that are impressive when a community can a community ran team 
right, isn't can have like the longevity. Mm-hmm. Like there's something to be said about that. For sure. It says a lot about your community, probably two or three families that have rolled in and, and kind of, you know, been there till three o'clock in the morning, wiping up after fundraisers and, and hitting up businesses in the community to keep the thing rolling. Yeah, it sure does seem to be, again, I, I haven't studied a lot of teams, but it seems to me growing up in this area that one of the surest ways to ga- gas or to end the, the lifespan of one of these organizations is to to bring in paid players. You know, make it a, a you know, slip in a player here, slip in a player there. To me, if you're, you're a community that has one of those teams, before you do that, you should probably go talk to Brad Simons, who got the Hillmont Hitman rolling again, and the PV boys who got their program rolling again, the Paradise Hill that got their team rolling again. And, and it takes a lot of blood, sweat, and tears to get a team rolling again and get some jerseys bought and get eight players committed to playing and then have losing seasons for five in a row. It, it might be best to just not go down that path. You know, is it really worth the one victory to lose a team for 10 years? Seems to me. I would agree. Mm. I would agree. I'm, I wasn't there when the team got rolling. All I can remember about the Hitman, I used to tell people this all the time, was I think it's year two, Brad. I wish we should have brought Brad in on this. I think it's year two of the Hitman. Think about this. You just got a community team rolling back in. We're in the first year of tryouts. You got like 30-some skaters. Everybody wants to see it survive. And it's either, I want to say it's year two. Because year three, I come in late at the end of that. And year two is when they combine with Lashburn because both teams don't have enough right. guys to play. Right? That's how hard it is to get a core that can stay together to keep a team rolling. Mm-hmm. Like, it's a lot of bloody work. And I don't know if people understand that. I, I don't think so. I think we've seen some of that in our own, own community maybe. is uh, the, these. It's not that the senior program is the end-all be-all. It's just... Your your town is healthier if you have a healthy senior hockey program. Healthier if you have a minor healthy minor hockey program. If you have uh, you know a minor, figure skating or a can skate group, or if you have volunteers and fundraisers, boy, if you can get a lot of different people all pulling the same direction, that keeps your rink open. That keeps your coffers full. That pays for jerseys. That pays for ice rentals. That pays for you know well just to keep the community rolling. And and you lose any one of your legs, you know, like let's say senior hockey. There's something that's not renting the ice now. That's uh, uh, kids that aren't looking at somebody that's saying, one day I want to be Sean Newman and wear that C for the I Hitman. I how many kids that was, but <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, I get what you're saying because yeah. I grew up watching the very end of the All-Stars, like the very last. I have like very faint memories of dad yeah. taking us down there. And then the rest of your childhood, they're, they're, they're not there, right? And uh, I think it's Jay talks about when he came back, the All-Stars weren't going, so he plays for Kid Scotty, mm-hmm. right? Even Dustin started playing for Kid Scotty. And you miss out on... When you don't have that mm-hmm. place for people to step into, right? It's just part of your evolution of going up through a minor hockey system. And then if you can build um, something that is is steadfast and a good program with good structure, and you know, mm-hmm. then you can filter people in. And then you got another aspect of your entire hockey feeding into. I mean, the heart of all small Saskatchewan communities, for sure. And I mean, right where we are, little Alberta communities as yep. well. We'll put it this way. If you and I were owners of uh, the Hillmond Arena or the Hillmond Hockey Group, it's just one of your business lines, right? You want to you want to keep your senior hockey program rolling. Why? Because they fill the rink, they rent it, they they buy all the fans come in, buy burgers, right? Uh, it's a place for the, the, the midgets to, to filter into. The, they want to keep playing some hockey. Something for the the community to do, come to on a Saturday night. You'd also want your minor hockey to keep rolling because they, they buy burgers on the Saturdays and they do rink rentals and they do raffle tables and all the rest. And then your can skates, you want them to go. So if there's somewhere for the kids to learn how to skate to jump into. To me, as soon as you get into a community where there's us and them, right? It's like uh, we're the most important and they're they're not, you know, is where that's just unhealthy, I think. And and, and I think you'd want all all types, all alive, all healthy, and everybody should be supporting each other. I think. Well, it's not what I think. It's just, that's a fact. Yeah. 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 You know, another thing we talked about, um, I had to chuckle. So in the first interview, I'm talking about how you got a mark across your eye and we literally just come from probably our first day of jujitsu. Now I haven't been in jujitsu yep. for probably a year, year and a half, but you, sir, have been going quite a bit. And on top of that, the guy we discuss, the, the, the grizzly 
a uh, man who should have been back in ancient Rome, Tanner Applegate, you guys have uh, uh, a podcast together. Yeah. So, I mean, the jujitsu thing, yeah, that's been my, maybe that's been, yeah, I have gone very hard at it, actually. You know, I've done uh, a lot of, a lot of kickboxing, a lot of jujitsu, doing some light MMA now. And I, we got to get you back. You know, I think you should come back and, and uh, I've got some extra equipment. For, come, come try a boxing, a kickboxing class or two, because uh, it's very, very different than than the jujitsu. But you guys, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. You've been going at noon hours and e- early evenings, right? Um, I go as often as I can because it's my mental out. It's my mental break. Uh, like you're talking, I, I don't really drink a whole bunch anymore. Um, as, as much as, as uh, life is still really good for me and my marriage is good and, and, and you know, still have work and fridge is full of food. I think COVID has been hitting everybody a little bit differently. And uh, I'm, I'm finding it very, very mentally difficult. I got to say, I, I, it was easy for me and it's, it's getting hard. And, and it's, my, it's my out, you know. And, and so, yeah, I go as often as I can. I, I think some, everybody does something differently for different reasons. And when you get in there into a threatening environment where you got to sweat is the rest of the world just falls away, you know, and it's just you and that's the person that's trying to kick your face off or, or choke you. And, and, and I like that. I like that. It's, 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 I would say my, one of the things that's really going well for me in my life is, is physical condition, you know, um, doing that. It, I thought I was getting old. I thought my injuries were there forever. I thought I was, it was just time to kind of slowly ride off into the sunset and stop skiing and stop wrestling and stop jumping on a trampoline and stop motorbiking in case I twisted up a knee and maybe should just consider myself fortunate that I got this late in life without any major injuries. Yeah, I was wrong. I, I, I'm not getting old. As a matter of fact, by pushing my body there, I, I reversed age in, in my body. So yeah, but getting back to your thing about the podcast, yeah, that's kind of what got us going actually. We'd have to give credit to Tanner Applegate for he dropped the word in my ear and then I dropped it in everybody else's ear to say, I, you know, so Tanner's trying to get a, a, a jujitsu club going. Not a club, but a group of us would go to the, the fight farm. And uh, yeah, so us doing a podcast, it's interesting. It, I, I mean, I'm still very uh, much struggling with time and, and the podcast is called War on Weakness. And Tanner, like you say, he's a 240 pound power lifter. That's very, very hard to get off of you when, you, when you're on the bottom and he's, he's this grizzly Viking so on top of you, the, uh, and so it, it's, I, I agreed to do it with them for, for a year, not so much to do what you're doing. I like, I don't have any aspirations right now of, of doing it as a full time or, or, or getting to a million listeners. I looked at it as a, as a personal challenge. It was like a, a time to, a, to the, the goal of the podcast is to look at anything that is considered a weakness and talk about it and try to help ourselves or others to maybe cheat the curve to find strength in an area where maybe they're weak and also to have a, a local influence on businesses and entrepreneurs in this tough uh, economic environment to help inspire and encourage people to support local business. I could give you a few examples and this is not at all, matter of fact, it's quite the opposite for me. I, I can't speak for Tanner. I mean, you said one day we'll, we'll, he'll, you'll have us both on, but for me, it's definitely not to say that I'm strong. It's more to say, let's take a, a really raw look at everything and and get a little bit deep into it and find out where you're strong and where you're weak and where you need some work. And so things that we've, we've talked, we've, we're just getting rolling now. But uh, physical strength, powerlifting was one, uh, fighting was one, martial arts, hunting is, is another one, you know, how, how to hunt and what it does and how it's primal and, and all that kind of stuff. But I'd like to get into uh, mental health, you know, uh, marriage, um, you know, depression, uh, you know, just any, anything, local businesses, local businesses that have persevered, you know, we want to have you on, you know, like uh, to talk about perseverance and how to, how to keep digging deep and keep pushing forward and, and finding some success. And so for me, it's, it's more like, I just want to throw myself into the, 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 the deep end of the pool and say it's time to try to get strong in as many areas of your life as possible. And the ones that are your, your weak or struggling, face it, face it head on, go run at it, punch it in the face, and, and try to try to try to take take it off your back. And, and yeah, so that's that's it. I find myself thinking 
I'm not sure if paradigm is the right word. But if you go back to the very beginning of this, we're talking about slowing down and enjoying the stage of life you're at because it will pass you by. And then in the same breath, you're talking about trying to amplify this moment to almost become the best human being possible. And maybe that's not the exact thing you're trying to do, but, uh, you know, trying to attack all your weaknesses. And sometimes I struggle with making those two things come to terms with each other. Uh, I'm, uh, uh, I'm not interviewing all the different areas and attacking it like your mindset is. But I find myself, well no different than not drinking right now. I'm constantly trying to do things to keep my mental focus, my body, relationship, everything, you know, you got to keep working at it. And I always wonder if my focus over here on, on trying to become better, right? Personally, takes my mind off of what we just talked about at the very start, which is focus on where you're at, your stage of life, because this is, by all accounts, the happiest time you're ever going to be with all your children where they're at, mm-hmm. your your marriage where it's at, etc. Hmm. So, are you are you asking like, are are you asking? Am, are we? Am I focusing on too many things? Are you asking? Yeah. Sorry, I didn't really say ask yeah. a question. I guess that's what I'm that's what I'm getting at is by putting so much energy into, you know. I, I've watched uh, Ken uh, for people who don't know, right? Like I met Ken at the home on arena after a Hitman game, having a couple of sass brillas, mm-hmm. which we didn't get to do last night. Not because I wasn't drinking mm-hmm. because the bar ain't open. It's kind of odd mm-hmm. times. That's kind of been a staple of a, a Hitman game. Everybody kind of congregates upstairs and you get to have a BS with all the town locals. Well, we met and at the time you're doing your MBA, mm-hmm. you're running a business uh, you get involved with hockey. You got five kids. Now you got six. You're uh, renovating your house or finishing your house, mm-hmm. right? And you're doing all these things. And I remember... Uh, teach, teach college classes. Teach yeah. college. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Anything else I'm missing, right? And, and what I'm getting at is you're just... you're. That's why I always bring up how do you find the energy? How do you find the time? Because you are a guy who does not like having seconds wasted. Mm-hmm. Not hours, not days, like seconds. Like, I mean, you want to make every day as productive because in 10 years, you don't want to miss out an opportunity to be better in 10 years than you are currently, right? Mm -hmm. I think I look at that and I go, wow, that's, that's impressive. But then we talk about, on the other hand, that you need to slow down and enjoy where you're at. All good questions. They're all ones I'm wrestling with right now. And I would say that I would say that um, I don't know. What, I don't know what to say. Actually, one would be that I'm trying to slow down um, and do things that mean the most to my family or, or to uh, what I feel like I should be doing. I would also say that up until this last, I would say, couple of months, maybe Sean, maybe it's a little bit more. I, I would say that I was endless in energy, not endless, but I. You're kind of the same. I, I could I could do a lot. And it's interesting, the, the, my war on weakness and, and one of them I'm, I'm going to have to conquer this year if I'm going to stay true to myself, I'm not quite ready to talk about it yet, uh, um, is that some of the things that COVID's thrown down has been really hard on me and uh, I'm not as productive as I was. Uh, um, you know, some might, you know, they say that life kind of has Sometimes you shouldn't set yourself up to say, once I get through this one or two challenges, then life will be easy. Because, yeah, sure, those challenges go, but two more arise, right? And so right now, you know, things that I'd say that I've, I've done well on is uh, loving my wife, uh, uh, being a good dad, uh, um, my physical physical condition, eating well, not drinking a whole bunch. So those things are really doing well. Uh, um, COVID uh, for me mentally is wearing me and my productivity has dropped considerably. Um, you know, someday I'll mention it to you. I haven't ever told you uh, uh, about it. Um, 
and I feel weak for saying that I don't want to talk about it right now. Um, it's okay. <clears throat> It'll come. <laughs> Son of a gun. Anyways, but I, I got to address it, right? It's a, um, it's part of the war on weakness. And, and it's, so when you ask me, why am I doing it? That's, it's for reasons like that is if, if, uh, if I can't learn to, to, uh, battle it and win, then how do I teach my kids, you know? And, and uh, um, yeah, anyways, I think I'm going too far down that path, but I, that would be, that'd be why I'm doing it because the, you know, I've got my own struggles. Everybody's got their struggles. And and things that we're, we're talking about taking on are exactly, um, for example, uh, um, you know, one would be, uh, Tanner's done a little bit of studying on it, is uh, pornography addiction. Seems harmless. It seems like, you know, you know, guys just looking at a few pictures on their phone. Turns out, I didn't know this, that there's a lot of people addicted to it, you know, and, and it's it's a dopamine hit that goes off in your head and, and, and it can really crash your life, you know, and why don't we talk about that? You know, why don't, why don't we, why don't we just, like I say, hit it straight on, wrestle with this son of a gun and talk about it. So that people talk about it. People talk about, you know, uh, depression or suicide or what it feels like to be unemployed, right? Or, or under financial stress or, you know, so, so sorry, I didn't mean to tear up on you there. The, the, uh, listen, yeah, uh, I'll say this, you know, you go back and you, you're trying to redefine manly. It's, o it's okay to be emotional about things. I, uh, totally. Yep. You, you know, there, there's things that uh, are hard to talk about. And I find those things, personally, usually the ones that are you need to talk about. I think that's what's great about talking to people. Um, I think, you know, shout out to my sister-in-law, Becky, and my and my and one of my older brothers, Dustin. When we almost lost our son, Casey, that was like the hardest day of my life. Yeah. And that is hard to talk about, like hard yeah. to go back. And, and I hate, you know, I I interviewed Hi Ma and I shouldn't say too much because he didn't want me to release, uh, I won't release, sorry, but I, I did an interview for the archives and it's he's from Vietnam and he has an um, unbelievable story and he talks to me about, you know, it's hard to go back through these events in my life. It's hard to tell you about it, right? It's PTSD, right? Mm -hmm. Um Judy Reeves who survived the perfect storm. She said the exact same thing. And you almost feel, and I'd listen actually to a flurry, uh, Theo Fleury interview. And he talked about it. Like these events are hard to live. Not that that's what you're talking about, but for me personally talking about, uh, where Casey, at, especially cause he's a healthy, happy boy right now. And mm -hmm. he just is like amazing. Right. But that probably three days of my life, you go, man, if I could never experience that again. But that's life. That's the highs and lows of life. And talking about it is, is just healthy. I, at least for me, Ken. I, I'm, I, uh, I always wonder about my mother um, because when dad left, uh, you know, to go long haul trucking, mom was at home with, Jay would have been close to, you know, out of high school, whatever, but for sure, four kids, maybe five, I don't know. And I just go like, I'm such a social person. How many times do I do this a week? I love mm -hmm. talking to people. It is the healthiest thing for me. It has mm -hmm. been why I went from one podcast a week in COVID to upwards of five is because I need to talk to people. I can't, mm -hmm. the more they try and isolate us, the more I'm on my Zoom calls, whatever, because I'm like, I can't go down that road. I need to... Uh, continually converse with people because if I go the other way, my brain and I've talked to you about it. The one of the things I wanted to talk to you about is the inner monologue. It it is a strange little beast that little voice inside your head. And at days I don't want to understand it, and I can't. Sometimes I can't argue with him out of the way he's thinking. Mm -hmm. Right? It's it's really it's well, really tough. I agree with you 100. It's part of the is um again it's part of this this journey I'm trying to go down is. There's, I think if you, I think what I'm learning is that if you're bluntly honest with yourself, you're going to look at yourself and say, you know what? Some things are working well. Some things are okay. And as opposed to just kind of floating through life, if you decide to kind of stare at it straight in the face and, 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 you know, there are probably going to be a few, uh, things that, you know, bring a tear to your eye. 
and I think you're right. It's good. It's kind of my journey right now. It's, it's maybe kind of something that's kind of stumbling me up a bit. And, but definitely I agree with you about talking about it. Uh, maybe it's a male, male, uh, uh, weakness and, uh, um, and that's okay. You know, everybody's got their own journey. And I just think that, um, it's one of those things I just want to, I just want to wrestle with it a bit more and then kind of, um, not conquer it, but, uh, um, speak about it with some strength as opposed to kind of in a, in a weak moment. You realize you have me curious as all hell. Well, it's not. Yeah. I mean, uh, um, yeah, it's, it's not that big of a deal. It's just, it's just, uh, Oh, Kenny. Yeah. It's obviously a big deal. Yeah. It's okay that it's a big deal. Well, let's, so we end off with essentially what's, what's nagging on you, yep. right? And I don't know, you bring up, I think if I'm listening to the first part of this and hear you break down, you know exactly where my head was. Because yep. as soon as I turned it off, I went, I went to the worst thing. Yep. For a parent, the worst thing I can think of is molestation. Yeah. Right? Now, Kenny, was it molestation? No, you threw that out. I, I appreciate it, Sean. Like you're, you're, you, uh, you threw out that I'm one of your closest friends and you're one of mine. And it's really important to have those in your life. And uh, um, it's, it's, uh, uh, um, you know, like uh, what I'm wrestling with is ADHD. And uh, <clears throat> when I'm, when I figured out how to, how to wrestle with it better, I'll come back. Um, <clears throat> could could you, could you do this for me? Because here's here's I don't know a lot about ADHD, and I know knowing Ken, you've done a lot of research on it, right? What I know about ADHD is there's lots of people who get it, and certain people have different ways of of medicating it, but it's kind of become a commonplace thing, mm -hmm. like kind of like which is good. Oh, that isn't that big a deal. You got ADHD. Yep. Kind of like that's what it is. But you've you've sunk your teeth in this, and I just what what is the I don't know what is ADHD. Why don't we start with that? Maybe I'll just start, Sean. But <clears throat> I think for me to speak to it, I'd like to just take a bit more time to wrestle with it. You know, uh, is my you you are a really good friend. I really appreciate what you've done for me today. Um, and that, uh, you know, the, by me just stating what I stated, it's like, well, I mentioned to you earlier is the only way I beat somebody on the jujitsu mat is if I step on the mat. The only way you beat somebody on a hockey, hockey rink is if you step on the ice and I just stepped on the mat. And so, uh, I appreciate you cause that's a big, big, <laughs> big step for me. <clears throat> um, well, and, and I was saying to you off air, right? Yeah. Like one of the things that... You know, we, we talk a little bit about COVID here and there, and I'm no expert. Let me be very bloody clear on that. I can only see what my eyes see. So mm -hmm. if in six months we have a huge outbreak, maybe my tune will change. Eight months ago, my tune was different. But what I see happening in around our pocket of the world, people losing their jobs and people struggling with the mental side of life. And my mental side of life is I'm almost back up to the heaviest weight I've ever been. And we were just talking about... Uh, um, you know, when the book club got together, it was around the time I was at the heaviest I'd been. So that was why we stopped drinking. Yeah. Because I wrote in a journal saying, listen, the cause of all evil is drinking because this is this and this happened, right? There was like four things. And so I cut it out for a month. And then you started exercising more and then you started eating right. And things just kind of snowballed. And I got down to the lowest I've been. Mm -hmm. And here I sit, knowing exactly what I have to do. And yet, this inner monologue of mine fights me on it every step away. So what the hell is that, Ken? Um, you know what? When you said it to me, Sean, it's uh, uh, oh, life and good friends. You got to be pretty thankful for them to have them in your life. What you mentioned to me about a week ago, I think, Ken, I'm the heaviest I've been for a long, long time. And it hit me in my head. I'm like, oh, man, I wish I could tell them because... I'm in the best shape I've been in since I've been, you know, 19 years old. But what he doesn't know is, is I'm really struggling inside. And, and I think you're saying that you're really 
uh, doing well mentally because of the podcast doing well and works and, doing well. And, well, and just talking to people. Yeah, and I was just like, oh, isn't that, that's that's why friendships are, are so important is because all I got to do is drag his butt into the gym to come do some kickboxing. All he has to do is drag, you is on drag me out onto a podcast <laughs> and, and we can pull each other along, we give each other a hand up, you know. Uh, and uh, so I, I thank you for that. Um, I, I don't know if I want to go I got to do some wrestling again with, with it. But what I can say is, is, uh, um, is that I don't view it right now. I don't view it as a, as a disease or, um, you know, a genetic, genetic flaw. I look at it as just being different. And just like everybody else, like there's, there's, everybody's going to have, some people are tall, some people are short, right? Some people are good at math. Some people are writing. Oh. My, my ADHD has, has, uh, um, at times served me really, really well really well i think and at times it's debilitating and uh, um and so i find that right now with with the covid environment is it's just too too much it's too much noise too many schedules too many deadlines too many emails from schools that i can't forget to drop a kid off on time or pick him up or uh, you know, and then I teach as well, and that's just got a, a whole bunch of more <laughs> things to do hoops and to jump. hoops to jump. And yeah. you know, where where I'm good is is with people. Like if I if I just gotta show up to my class and talk to 25 students, or show up to a hockey rink with a with a practice plan, or make it into my MBA group to to complete a project, I'm cool with that. I'm really good at it. And and the, a lot of the other things have come along. With. So now here I am, and and here's what's been beating me up a little bit is. You know, Ken, dust dust off your knees. Let's let's go. Like, come on. You you got more in you. This is this this is disappointing. You know firsthand. We both have friends that right now don't have jobs. You know, I, I I've seen some stats recently. Uh, uh what was it? It was four point nine percent. Four point nine percent. Hold on, I wrote it down actually. In two thousand and fourteen, there was four point nine people per thousand that went bankrupt that filed for bankruptcy 2020 they're saying 190 per thousand and a recent article that i read from canada are considering bankruptcy opio death right you know uh, uh i don't know if it's doubled but it's in that range suicides up unemployment up i don't have op opioid addiction i'm not divorced i haven't been laid off i don't have depression i don't have anxiety i don't have schizophrenia i don't have you know, and I'm finding this tough. Like, how how is the world that they're doing? And it's kind of part of this COVID thing. That's kind of, you know, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say it's pissing me off. Is because, well, you and I both wrote, read Nassim Taleb and the skin in the game. You know, and one of the things he said, actually, I wrote it down as well, is. If you give an opinion and someone follows it, you are morally obligated to be exposed to its consequences. When I, when I look at a lot of people are giving us the advice right now, and I, I don't know, they seem like smart people. You know, it's part of one of my struggles again is so much information, isn't it? And it's so polarized, you know, like from the social media and this and that is, is that you're either 100% believing COVID is real or it's complete hoax. It's, it's, it's the, the inner workings of the world that are figuring out how to vaccinate us and control us. And the other ones are like, you're stupid if you don't just follow the science. And to me, what I see is people, first of all, we're mixing politics, business, social opinion, and they're coming with conclusions on to tell us how we're going to run our lives. And what I hear are politicians, doctors, uh, uh, media, all telling us with the daily headline of how many people are dying and how bad it is. And we need to put restrictions in place that maybe they're right, you know, but they all have their jobs. They still have full paychecks, right? You know, like who's speaking for the weakest, you know, the, those who are unemployed, who, who have gone bankrupt, who have lost their businesses. Um, where's their voice, you know, because there's something, and this gets into your inner dialogue, maybe we'll get there, but you know, uh, what do they call it? Utilitarianism, where it's, we should only make decisions that create the greatest group good for the greatest number of people. And 
is this the greatest good for the greatest number of people? You know, like if we could talk to the people that are, are, are on opioids or unemployed or depressed or laid off or losing their homes, you know, where, where's the daily update for us? You know, COVID deaths today, where's the daily update on, on the suicides? Where's the daily date rate on, on bankruptcies? Where's the daily update on, on uh, um, depression and mental health? You know, what I'm, I'm experiencing, I'm certainly not alone. And, and to me, we're too centrally focused just on the, the, the COVID. There's, there's the unintended consequences that, that are coming. And I, I think we're seeing right now. So I guess I'm really feeling for people because, man, if, I, if I'm having a tough time, you know, and, and I'm doing okay, you know, and all, all else being equal, you know, a lot of things are going well in my life. So inner dialogue, you know, like, you know, I'll let, I'll let you, you, you respond. I'll, I'll let you, your thoughts. I've talked too much. No, I, you have not talked too much. Um, I think I mirror everything you just said about, you know, it, the U.S. election, whether we want it to be big or not, mm-hmm. in the world, the most powerful nation, is its election is big news, mm-hmm. right? You can sit in the U.S. or you can sit in France, you can sit wherever and, and try and act like it's not. It's huge consequences for the world. And what it told me was that the world is more divided than it's ever been yeah. or close to it. I mean, there's been elections. You go back to when Bush was elected and against Gore, and, and that was about as identical. What is, what is really, really difficult for me is that you can't escape it. I want to escape it. Like, yep. I want, like, man... <sighs> I love the utility of a phone and the internet and like access to information. It's done us world of good in the book club, mm-hmm. right? Being able to yep. find guys like we talk about all the time. Kids today will be exposed to whatever author from anywhere on the world or maybe in time, any class from anywhere on the world, right? If all universities go to where you can get it on YouTube or whatever, and now you can be influenced by the greatest professors with never stepping foot in Harvard or, or wherever, University of Toronto. It's amazing. But when you want to escape the U.S. fucking election, mm-hmm. and for six goddamn months, all you get rammed down your fucking throat, mm-hmm. sorry to throw out so many mm-hmm. F-bombs, Mom, is Trump's the best, Trump's the worst, Trudeau's the best, Trudeau's the worst. Like, who gives a flying shit? I'm, I'm almost kind of tired of it. Mm-hmm. But I can't escape it because it is everywhere. I go to work, it's there. I go out to sight. It's there. And mm-hmm. that's what COVID is right now. Mm-hmm. So not only did we have the U.S. election, not only did we have Trump, uh, Trudeau every day, you got COVID. So you got all these things being rammed down your throat. You said to me, I think it was last night, maybe it was a few days ago, that you just, you don't know why, but you're feeling stressed, right? Mm-hmm. Like you're just tired. I think our entire population or majority of our population is all feeling that because you can't run from it right now. You want to, the only way you can is you turn your phone off. But so many, if you're working, of your jobs rely on that phone being on. So you unhinge yourself from social media and everything else, but then you show up and all anyone wants to talk about ain't sports. Now, I I never understood the utility of sports. Really Mm -hmm. didn't. Mm -hmm. And the longer this goes on, I go, man, I just want all sports to come back full-fledged. I will never bitch and complain about how much Euler talk there is because it is something just non-relevant to banter about. And honestly, people go, who gives a shit about the Oilers? Well, now I understand why people give a shit about the Oilers. It's hell of a lot more fun to banter about the shitty job they're doing than whether or not we're about to be taken over by the second coming of the Antichrist and everything else. And you can't figure out if it's science or if 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 the guy is the Antichrist, right? Like, that's all everything is right now. You're either an idiot or you're a genius. But the other side thinks you're an idiot while your side thinks you're a genius at all times. How can the mind possibly comprehend all that? And try doing it with ADHD, <laughs> right? It's, it's not fun. The, uh, um, yeah, I, I, I'm with you is that this, you got everybody, you got, you got to watch the social dilemma on, on Netflix. I have. You have to, right? Watch that and tell me if you're listening to this or anybody's listening to this, you, you, you know, don't you find... Like, look at what we've gone through in the last, what would you say, two years of extreme separation on climate change, on well, Black Lives one. Matter, climate change, yeah, on uh, um, Trump Biden, on um, COVID, 
And it's just so polarized. And now it makes sense to me why it does after watching the social 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 dilemma is the, the algorithms that feed you what your initial belief is. You know, now I get it that if we talk about flat earth, which they mentioned on the social dilemma, is that if you believe flat earth and you Google it, then they've got you. They know that you're into it. And then they're going to start feeding you videos. So you watch one or two videos. And then before you know it, you're like 100% convinced because it's confirmation bias. They're going to feed you all the, all the videos and Facebook feeds you can handle and dog on it. You are right. I get that we can, <laughs> I'm sorry for the flat earthers out there, but you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to put myself solidly in the camp that it's not a flat earth. There, we have a round earth. However, and they might dis- disagree with me on that and that's okay. But people, what's really pissing me off is that people who, yeah, you got, you got a, you got a science degree and now you can tell me that I'm an idiot because I don't believe everything the politicians are telling me about COVID or vice versa. You got a, poli sci degree in something and now you're qualified to tell everybody that COVID isn't real or is real and everybody else is an idiot and they're not educated. Just follow the science. Just on COVID alone, there is very, very noteworthy professors, academics, uh, uh, um, smart people on both sides of this equation. This science isn't settled. So people, when you're sharing your Facebook feeds that say, don't be stupid, just, just do, do this or don't do that or you're stupid. I don't care which side of the coin you're on. The reality of it is, this isn't a settled argument. This is new to us. And the social dilemma should should make you stop posting such extreme extreme shit, right? That you're, you're 100% on one side of the other. And I'm with you. It's stressful. It's really stressful. I'm tired of it. I'm kind of ready to smash my phone, right? Because it's, 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 you got to wonder against getting back to this utilitarianism is, I wonder if the greater good, because you've you mentioned your, your podcast, you know, you watch Social Dilemma and you're like, I'm, I'm kind of feeding the thing that's that's hurting and, and we can talk about that it is to me we know that as much as covid's rate brought down some harm there's gonna be some good that comes out of it too facebook and snapchat and instagram we know there's bad that has come out of it, but there's gonna be good as well but are we doing the greatest amount of good for the greatest amount of people and that's a hard thing to measure what is good i get it uh, um, I think it was Jeremy Bentham, I think was the, the philosopher that, that first started that. But is, is that if the algorithms are potentially driving the U.S. towards civil war, if they are driving us towards hating our neighbor, maybe maybe that does need regulation. Maybe that does need some of you step in and say, stop the algorithms. It's going to drive us apart towards hate and racism and everything negative all the negative all the things negative. of society instead of the positive things going on you meet two reasonable people i consider that are trying to just live a good life and trying to leave some something good behind us and and we're driven to like i i'm here in the frustrate you just dropped a whole bunch of f-bombs you know i had a meltdown right you know like we're not alone here and you know uh, uh so so where where are we going to go to this like like let's let's go out 10 20 30 years what can we do today that stops us from getting to where this is potentially going, right? And are, are we okay with that? Is it, you know, before we take up arms against our neighbor because we're going to vote for different people? You know, we're talking about a free society. It took a long time to get here. This free free thinking, free speech, free, free ability to move, open debate, it took a lot to get here. Like, you know, I'm not a history specialist, but I've done enough reading to know this was an easy journey to get here. And what we have is special. And it, I'm, I think we're watching it take a step backwards. And when I hear people say they're talking about taking up arms for Trump or against Trump or for Biden, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Where, where, where does that end? You know, and, and maybe it does need to be regulated by the government. I mean, it's not for you and I to solve. I'm, I'm just, all I'm saying is, I don't even know what I'm saying. I'm just frustrated with it all. I'm frustrated, really frustrated. So, it, so your one, podcast, do you, you want to talk about that for a moment? Like your thoughts, your inner dialogue? Yeah, sure. Uh, um, just to, just to finish that thought, yep. what I find very hard and confusing is that we should have an answer for that, mm-hmm. right? Like, if I wanted to, if I want to have effect, I, I've been trying to come to terms with this. If I want to change the world, I want to change the world. Well, first, you got to start somewhere, mm-hmm. right? Which is I don't know, Hillmont, Lloyd, whatever bubble you want to take sure. as, right? A small bubble. <laughs> Sean ranting on his podcast, but the world ain't changing shit, 
right? I, I, you don't I'm, think so? Maybe it is. May, well, maybe it is. May, hey, I'll tell you what. Maybe it's it's a little ripple, sure. But I think I think what we can have effect over is over what we can have effect over, which is like essentially to me, Lloyd Minster in the air. There's enough stories going on in our community alone where you could actually impact some change that would make the world a little better place. And I, I sometimes, well, not sometimes, I find myself thinking more that if we all stopped worrying about what the hell is going on on the other side of the world and whether people are racist or whether we need to do this or do that and just focused on what's going on in Lloyd, make Lloyd a better place. And then maybe... I don't know, Vermilion makes Vermilion a better place. And then Vagerville does the same. And we all follow that thought process. Maybe then things start to get better. Instead, we're going down this rabbit hole of like the Easter bunch of effing whatevers. Huh. I tell people this all the time. I've been through the East, all the way from the East Coast to here. And I get it. They got They vote liberal and they vote this way and they vote that way. I've talked with a lot of smart people from there. They're good people. Mm-hmm. There are people like me and you that are probably wrestling with sure. diff- similar but different arguments. Mm-hmm. And we all just keep focusing on things that we have no control over. We have control. Bring it back to what you have control over. You have control over your life and your decisions. And for me, that probably means coming to terms with what's going on. Because what's been bothered, what bothered me before this was this room wasn't done. It mm-hmm. really, And I didn't realize mm-hmm. how much it bothered me. Mm-hmm. And then I got the... The, the the jerseys on the wall and then within like a day everything else was finished and I was like whew I, f- I feel pretty good and when you feel pretty good the world starts looking a little brighter hmm. and I don't check my phone that often and yeah going to the store it's all slammed in your face again because masks are on and anywhere you go people are yelling because they don't want to wear a mask and I don't mean actually yelling at the stores mm-hmm. I just mean when you get in a close group like mm-hmm. this all we do is complain about it well it's life. Mm-hmm. And if you actually want to change that, actually, mm-hmm. then get in politics and start moving the ball that way. That's a damn good good statement there. It's because it's easy to uh, bitch and complain, isn't it? Uh, um, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a good point, Sean. And, and, you know, in relation to your podcast, yes, it's, in my opinion, it's uh, part of uh, the social media. Yes, it's... Um, it's probably going to feed into an algorithm somewhere, you know, that uh, uh, somehow they'll grab it. And if you start Googling sports, podcast, NHL, Lloyd Minster, it's probably going to start feeding up somewhere, you know. But but I, I know you quite well. And I've always found you to be, uh, what's the word I'd say? Like, what are the things? Well, driven. Uh, uh, a little bulldog to get what he wants when he when he wants it, or not, not mean that in a good way, but a very oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Somebody that's like uh, son of a god, I can't think of the word. Um, can boil things down to a simple, well reasoned perception of whatever we're looking at. For example, we are all in you know we both come from rural, primarily white communities. And there is no way I'm ever going to hear anything out of your voice that you dislike people of a certain color or of a certain religion, or you're going to say something like, you know what, the Eastern Canadians, I've been there. They're decent people, right? So, so I, I find that you that, that whoever, whatever that I'm talking about would come out in the flavorings of your podcast. And I've heard them, you know, one of the ones I really liked is your one with the sociologist or uh, psychologist out of Edmonton. I think he was a sports psychologist. Yeah. Sports, yeah. Um, oh, John Stevenson. Yeah. Like, like that was good. You had a positive impact on my life. Uh, um, I really liked listening to him, and and so that's what you're bringing. So, like, there's so many good things, like me being able to research ADHD, right? There's a lot of cool things out there with people that have it, and and, and it's wonderful, and it made, it's helping me. Uh, um, so I, I, for me, if I'm in your shoes, I don't look at it all. I, I say use your voice for the good, you know, and and you already are. So, my, for me. I say go bigger, go harder, go faster, and, and do more good. That's my thought. Well, I appreciate the compliments. Uh, I know when you said, do you want to talk about the podcast, one of the things that I've been wrestling with is I'm well-known in Lloyd, right? Grew mm-hmm. up here, so I know a lot of people in Lloyd, which means 
that when I do something, I think that I... It's not like being in a place of a million people where if I were to start the podcast and knew as many people as I did, it would get drowned out in the noise of a million Mm -hmm. people. It's small enough where it has some impact, like Mm -hmm. you're talking about. I have a real hard time coming to terms with everybody saying you're famous Mm -hmm. when in my mind, famous means... I have a different definition of famous. Famous is, uh, well, Matthew McConaughey, Mm -hmm. right? Is... Something along that lines. Joe Rogan, uh, Donald Trump, I don't mm-hmm. know. All right? Like, those are figures that are larger than life. Mm-hmm. Ah, right? And mm-hmm. I'm like, listen, what I'm doing is cool and is absolutely what is getting me through COVID other than my family and friends mm-hmm. and my wife because all those things are very positive influences on me. This is really positive. Think of just what we've gone through in the last hour and a half. It's mm-hmm. This is what, this is what I live for. Like this is unbelievable. It's part of your purpose, isn't it? Right. How you fit the world. You know, that's, this is Sean. But I don't equate that to fam- uh, famous. And maybe I just have a, maybe the, maybe I need to change my mindset on what people mean by calling it famous. Maybe, maybe I have it. Maybe you don't want famous. Maybe, maybe being Matthew McConaughey or Joe Rogan is the worst thing that could happen to you. <laughs> You know, uh, uh, but maybe we don't know, but I, I, how I would take that, when, this is going to be everybody's own perspective, but how I would take it is people are saying, I'm listening to you and I've heard people talk about you and you're doing a good thing and I want to give you a pat on the back, uh, you know, maybe. So maybe, maybe, and again, this is your own inner dialogue, so I can't speak for your inner dialogue, but maybe you, you dislike the term because you don't want to get proud of it or, or get an ego. I've known you a long time. I don't think that's a concern. <laughs> you're, you're, you're very down to earth. Down to earth is, would be one of the words I'd, I'd, I'd use to describe you. And I would say that, you know, what is famous, maybe, I don't know. For me, I just say it makes you tick. It makes you happy. It keeps you mentally strong. It, it fits you. You smile at it. You know, I say, uh, um, you know, who cares? The rest is just noise. Just keep being you. You know, uh, put your stamp on, on on life. You only get one crack at this and hats off to you for, for taking a run. You know, maybe maybe this could be an inspiration to others. Like somebody out there is maybe saying, you know what, I, I've i always had a dream of being a race car driver. Well, well, how did Sean get to a podcast where he's got, I don't know what you said, 1.5 million touches or I can't remember what the... But uh, a lot the, on the on the Twitter landscape, yeah, over a million, t- sure. whatever that means. Yeah. I don't know what that means. So the good, good on you. That, that, but how did you get that? By you and me painting up a little, little storm cellar and getting a computer <laughs> with a couple, a couple of mics, right? And so <laughs> somebody else has a dream of being a, a race car driver, and uh, <laughs> the, uh, 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 you know, go buy a, an old jalopy and throw some nitrous oxide on a on a souped up engine and go to your first race next next summer and, and go start, get one crack at this. So. You know, you know, it's so, it's so funny. You know, so many people uh, have come and asked, and I mean this in the Mm -hmm. most, I don't even know the word, but have come and asked like about starting a podcast, right? And I find when I hear you talk about it, it's, it's humorous. And I probably laugh a lot when they ask, I'm like, man, open your phone up, turn it on and start going. Because if I think about how I started, it was talking into my phone, which everybody has the capability of doing that. And when I think of our first episode, we like I bought like Kenny bought the computer, which was absolutely bottom of the line. Six hundred fifty bucks at Best Buy, I think it was. Yeah, like yeah. dirt cheap. And I bought some mics and a yeah. condenser. I didn't even know what it was. And you know, you think back to that and the simplicity of what we did, and what we did on a budget, right? Like that, that to where it started is almost hard to fathom. And I don't mean to say that I, I, I will say this again and again and again. I, I'm never, I don't think I'm ever going to be where I want to be because I want to, I want it to go the, the right direction, which in my word is a progression line upwards, mm-hmm. wherever that lands. Mm-hmm. But from where it started in your 
basement, well, in mm-hmm. a guy's basement in your, yeah. in your, yeah, for you know, in that helper. room, yeah, in that room with the mouse turds and, yeah. <laughs> you know, like yeah. one outlet and that bulb yeah. hanging off the ceiling. And you're, you're underselling yourself though, because the biggest part of that was you, right? A mic's a mic. Sure. Maybe a $250 mic sounds better than a $75 mic, but, but the, the, the part of it from the outside looking in, if I'm looking at from a business perspective, you know, my trainings in undergrad and, and masters and in, 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 in doing this, studying businesses, the biggest part of that puzzle was you, your drive, your determination, your ability to speak and your interest in people. So while it seems easy to you to other people, like I'd really like to start a podcast, but they might be introverted. And maybe the best thing for them is to not do a podcast because maybe they're meant to do something else. (laughs) Right. You know, the way I look at it is my brother, John, since he's been eight years old, he could tear apart any engine anywhere. And and within a year, have that thing looking like it's off the showroom floor. I can barely change a spark plug, right? So for when people like him would say, well, just just go fix your motorbike. It's like yeah, easy for you to say, you know, you, you could tear that thing down. I can barely change a spark plug but because that's him. That's his skill. That's his, that, that was his, his passion. That's his, 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 uh, his God-given abilities, right? So, so to you, it came easy. But so I, I, I don't know. I, I just, it's cool to watch. It's cool to watch you. It's cool to watch people when they align what they're interested in with some drive, with some determination and, and, and something that they're good at. It's just cool to watch, you know, and, and you're, you're all the above. It's, it's really, really nice to watch people that you care about and you want the best for wake up in the morning and say, I like, I like the direction my life is going and I'm starting to feel fulfilled. Right? Really, I guess you're kind of uh, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, aren't you? You know, you're, you gotta be sitting about that, that pokey little part at the top of the triangle must be getting you in the butt right now, the self-actualization, right? Do you remember Maslow's, <laughs> right? You know, like the, uh, right? The, the bottom is like, uh, you know, safety and food and this, that, and top is self-actualization. I, watching you, you're, you're doing that. It probably, probably you're, you're surfing a wave and uh, you should probably just enjoy the wave for as long as it comes because life, right? You know, like that's, that's one thing I'm learning is that, you know, like, for a while, my life was going fantastic and cranking off this, cranking off that. And then my wife's mom got a cancer diagnosis and that rocked our lives, right? And we had a really rough year. Wonderful year. Wonderful year at the same time, right? Got to know my mother-in-law said some really, really personal things to her that I wouldn't have said had I not known that she was dying. Uh, went to war with my wife, right? We got in the trenches and kind of, uh, you know, came out stronger than we went in. But but you're you're, I would say that, you, neither was no neither one maybe with my my issue that I'm talking about but but you're 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 in a good you're on a good wave on a good board right now right that son of a gun right you know like and then when you gotta swim back out and grab another wave and you grab it you know ride that son of a gun I say hats off take it for all you got and and if 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 your thought of being famous is any kind of a negative drag on you throw it away it's that's your own mind you know get rid of it it's a negative thought well. I really enjoyed this. Me too. I, I say that I say that to all my guests, but I I truly mean it to all my guests. But anytime I finally get to have the guy that helped spur this on, you know, you're one of you know I get to have the brothers in all the time, yeah. right? Like everybody gets a kick out of when me and the brothers get in and we have a couple scotches and we get yelling at each other about sports and they've been texting because we're in this stupid bet about the, I think it's the NFC East and I got yep. the Dallas Cowboys and frick, I hope they didn't win tonight. But anyways. I, they're part of what spurred this on too. And uh, you're another piece of that puzzle. And I really, really enjoy having you back in because there's a reason I wanted you on as my first guest, right? Like this is, it just flows so naturally, Ken. And uh, I really appreciate you opening up about some things. And, I, you know, I wish you nothing but the best here as we move along. And to anyone who listened, I, I just think, you know, I say this all the time that you just don't know what the next day is going to bring. And I mean that in the most positive way humanly possible. You don't know what door is going to open. I think of Castaway and, and, um, oh, who was the actor in Castaway? Uh, Why can't I think of his name? uh, The uh, Bob or the shrimp, right? Uh, Wasn't it Castaway? The, uh, oh, uh, the Vietnam War movie, right? Tom Hanks. Tom Hanks, yeah. Jeez Louise. Yeah. Right? He, He has a line in there about... You just never know what the tide's going to bring you in, yeah. right? And that's how he gets a sale, and it's it's yeah. it's part of a, a shitter. It's part, yep. <laughs> it's part of an outhouse, right? Yeah. And he uses it to escape the island. Yep. And I just, 
you know, as bad as stuff we're in, you were a guy who told me this eight, nine months ago when this first started. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's going to be good that comes out of this. I've heard you say it once in here, mm -hmm. and I think we're, all we're focused on right now a lot mm -hmm. is all the negativity coming out of it. As a population, I think that's what we're... And we've got to find a way to just, day by day, things we're going to get through this. There's going to be positive things that come out mm -hmm. of this. And I hope that, you know, rings true, and that's the thought I'm going to carry on forward. But you coming in and sitting here and chatting with me, man, I really do appreciate this, Kenny. Well, I appreciate you on many, many levels, Sean. And uh, I think you just helped me cheat the curve on my journey by a long, long shot. I, I thought this was going to be an eight or nine mind month journey before I was able to, to say anything to anybody. Um, and uh, yeah, and to anybody that's lasted long enough to listen to a normal, old, boring Joe like myself, thanks for listening. And Sean, uh, thank you for your friendship. Um, looking forward to many more years with you. And I hope the next, what number are you at for, for a podcast now? Uh, you got 100 one, with Ron McLean, so what do you have 130. Now? Well, the archives have thrown a mixture into it, so what are we at? Mm -hmm. 130. Bear with me. 132 you'll be. Huh, cool. Thank you, Sean. Thank you. This is wonderful. I thank you for having me on. Hey, folks. Thanks again for joining us today. If you just stumble on the show and like what you hear, please click subscribe. Remember, every Monday and Wednesday, a new guest will be sitting down to share their story. The Sean Newman Podcast is available for free on Apple, Spotify, YouTube, and wherever else you find your podcast fix. Until next time.